Welcome back to What You're Watching with Jamie and Bo. I'm Bo. I'm Jamie. And we start every show the same way, which is me asking uh, my dear friend Jamie, what you watching? Well, uh, quite a few things. But uh, before we get into that, I do actually have something to share. Oh. We got we got some mail. No and I know shit. That's not, I know that's not typically what we do here, but um, this was kind of cool. So I wanted to share it. Oh, please. Um, this is from Debbie Lynn. And she says, hi, Jamie, I just finished listening to your new podcast with Bo, What You're Watching, and really liked it. You two have a good rapport. Anyway, your story about the box of frozen puppies <laughs> sparked a memory I have of my mom. And I'm, oh, wow. <laughs> she, she liked to murder puppies and put them Don't in the freezer. Don't let story spark memories. And she's like, uh, my mom was older when she had me, and she grew up on a farm in a rural area of Pennsylvania. She told me and others in our family of a time when she was a little girl doing uh, during one especially bad winter. There was a small lake near their property that kids used to skate on when it was frozen over. That winter, two boys fell through the ice and died. Since my mom's family's farm was the closest place, the town authorities asked to keep the frozen bodies in their barn until the weather broke and they could have a proper burial. If I So my if I could, mm -hmm. Jamie, two things. First, uh, why did no one say the ice is gonna, it's gonna break? break? Yeah. Secondly, what the fuck? Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. By the way, she did give me permission to share this story if I wanted to, so I was like, "Well, oh, all right." Uh, so yeah. my mom said her and her sisters were terrified to go near the barn. I don't, I'm not surprised. Uh, it was locked up and had nightmares of seeing the boys standing outside. Of course, this haunted me as well, and I will never forget it. You're welcome to share this story if you want to, by the way. I'm happy to see you podcasting again. That, that's both horrifying and very nice all at once. Um, no, oh, Debbie's amazing. I, I appreciate the hell out of her, but that is a truly terrifying story yeah. like i ew that yeah that's the stuff of nightmares uh as, and it's as not the, even like it's a family member you know when uh like when people used to have to sit up i mean better no 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 wait <laughs> i am going somewhere with this when it you know when people used to have to sit up with the dead and you know you'd have a family member in the house or whatever at least if it was like your dad or something you know it it maybe it wasn't quite so scary because they were someone you were close to, but these are two just random boys from the town. I'm sure they knew them because it was a rural area, so they probably knew their neighbors. But I, I they're children too, and that just adds, you know, just a more horrifying bit to that story. You know, like you have two dead children in your barn, yeah, that are frozen. I mean, that's horrible and you know, and then imagine their families you know knowing that their boys are on somebody's random barn like i don't know that's that is creepy yeah that's that's two more dead children than you want in your barn at any given time yeah absolutely that's too too many so what, what was the first dead body you ever saw first dead body i ever saw uh, i guess it was Probably my great grandmother. I can't. No, 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 no. It was my great grandfather's sister. So I was probably around eight, I guess, when she died. And that would have been, I, I think, that would have been the first one that I recall seeing anyway. Hmm. Would I, I, mean, I? Um, I. I think it was actually my my buddy Chad's mother was the first dead body I ever saw. I, I mean, that was just an open casket funeral situation. Mm. But I the thing I remember most about that is uh, Chad telling me. I, I think he was in his twenties. I want to say. Um, she. I I want to say she was in her like mid to late fifties, and you know, got cancer and. You know, so the story goes. Uh, and uh, the thing I remember most is him saying, have you ever touched a dead body before? Mm -hmm. Me saying no, and him saying, well, let's fix that. Oh, yeah. all right. 
And so uh, we we I got to touch her face, which was weird. It is weird. I the the first dead body I ever touched was my great grandmother, and I was twelve when she died. And I, ever since then, and I just I don't know why I went up to the casket and and I was compelled just to see what it felt like, and it was weird. It didn't feel like touching a person. Yeah, because it was hard, but then like there, her flesh, it was almost like her flesh was wrapped over something like a cardboard tube or something. It, it just, and it just didn't feel natural. And then ever since then, I've had this thing where whenever I go to see someone, I like that's dead. I, I always, I don't know. I, I've touched everybody since then, and I don't really I don't know why that is. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Huh. I, mm-hmm. I, I did the one. I was kind of one and done with touching dead bodies. I, I was like, oh, that feels like room temperature deli meat, and I don't like that. And yeah, it's definitely a bizarre feeling, and, and I don't know why. I, I, I don't know why I do it, but I, I always do. I always touch the body. Do you make them high-five you? Is that how no. you do it? <laughs> no, I'd probably like snap their arm off or yeah. something. Yeah. <laughs> I, I learned just recently that most corpses uh, have butt plugs in them. To prevent, leakage. I did. I, I did hear that. Yeah, to to prevent the leakage. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's something. Well, the the the, the funerary business is uh, there are a lot of stuff that go along behind go on behind the scenes that they just you know people are better off not knowing you know right. especially when it pertains to your own family member like uh, nobody you, wants you to see the sausage made <laughs> you don't you don't want to know about that <laughs> yeah yeah that's why i like cremation cremation seems really nice and tidy to me it's like okay we're let's not you know take up a bunch of land and you know let's let's put the this nice urn in a place where people can actually see and appreciate the person you know and not make it a day trip where you're just looking at a a headstone i mean i get it i'm not telling anybody that you know has their loved ones or or wishes to be buried themselves i'm not saying that's a a bad idea i'm saying it just for me my own Mm -hmm. my own personal perspective cremation just makes so much more sense for me have you seen the 3d printed urns now that they can basically do the person's face like or the head yeah i've seen a little bit of that i i I like where that's headed it's not quite extreme enough for me yet like i want it to be a miniature me uh just you know scale down enough just to hold the ashes Mm -hmm. but doing like juggling or something you know something i could never do in my day-to-day life like i want i want to have a little uh adventure in death and i don't i that's not a bad idea that's um, not a bad idea. You know, I, like I, I had a number of ideas for my body disposal, most of which it turned out were illegal. <laughs> well, I, when I was younger, I wanted to be chopped up and fed to sharks and because I love sharks, you know, and then it turns out you can't do that. So Yeah, very similarly, I, <laughs> I wanted to be not, not chopped up and fed to sharks, but that I was probably going to end up there. Uh, I wanted to be catapulted into the ocean, uh, preferably to Freebird. Because I thought that would be very funny. Hey, why not? And, uh, you, well, you know you can get your ashes made into coral now. Well, um, yeah, we're destroying all the rest of it, so yeah, might, as so, well, might as well replace it. It's like you it. can actually become part of the part of the environment, which is like a neat thing, I guess. You know, I did I ever tell you I almost went to mortuary school? I don't think so. It doesn't yeah. ring a bell, but I drank no, a they, lot. The only reason I didn't was because we only had one in the state and it was too far away like it was too far to commute and so yeah. i was like oh well i'm not i guess i won't do that but i was i was interested in the mortuary arts for a while and i had an idea i was going to open a themed mortuary mm-hmm. <laughs> like where you could have like themed funerals i thought that would be like a fun way to send people off you know so it wouldn't be so dire all the time it would be whatever you thought that person would enjoy kind of like a wake but with more decoration and and varied themes you know <laughs> like, so here's what what i would want not that i'm the biggest star trek fan in the world but i would like a uh a, a re a recreation of the funeral for spock at the end of star trek 2 okay up to and including someone saying of all the souls i've met in my travels his was the most human 
And then, <laughs> and then you launch me out. Well, launch me out. Like, you can't launch a, a, a torpedo the way you do on Star Trek. So you, you just tie a rope to, like, a, a gurney or something and just pull me out on that thing. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have somebody playing the bagpipes, and it's, you know... It's a celebration for everybody because then Legit. people will be like, "Oh my god, that was a really good movie. I should go home and watch Wrath of Khan now." They could even screen it at your funeral. I, uh, yeah, but then you lose some of the immersion of the funeral. Well, well, and that's true. And also, if I was going to screen a movie at my funeral, it wouldn't be that one. Like it would be something I don't know, something I lo- like dearly loved. You know. Yeah. Uh, hey, uh, let's get slightly back on topic. Thank you, yeah. uh, Debbie, for the for the message. That's uh, a terrifying story, but thank you for sharing it. Um, and and if other people would like to, you know, reveal horrifying childhood memories, uh, then you know, send it to Jamie, and she'll screen those. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and then present them when the time is right. But speaking of screening movies, uh, let's get back to the original question about what you've yeah. been watching. Uh, so hit, well, hit me with something. Okay. Well, this is actually something that uh, whenever I watch it, it reminds me of you. And I, this was a random weekend morning. I was up by myself and I was just flipping through uh, like, I don't even know, like Hulu or something. And I was f- just flipping through just, you know, la la la. And I saw this movie and I was like, oh, I haven't seen that in a while. Let me watch it. And it's totally random, but it was Diary of the Dead. Oh, yeah. I, I, I think I saw, uh, I might have seen you post something about that. I was like, oh, yeah. Diary yeah. of the Dead. We saw that together. Yeah, we did. And that's why whenever uh, whenever I watch that movie, and then I think of you because we did actually see that film together. And we and were both equally yeah. yeah, we were both equally disappointed at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> But every few years, I like to watch it again just to see if my opinion changes. And um, what I notice is that there's a lot of a lot of just things that don't make any sense, like uh, decisions that don't make a lot of sense. I still really like I like the zombie stuff because Romero can do zombie stuff and that's fun. But some of the dialogue is just terrible. And I'm like, Ugh, God, that's awful. Like, What were you thinking, Uncle George? But you know it, that one doesn't really hold up all, all that well uh it just like i don't know if in the middle of a zombie apocalypse somebody's going to be like repeatedly saying and i mean repeatedly saying that they got 72,000 hits in an hour on their upload of <laughs> of the what's going on like it just doesn't after this covid shit i don't doesn't work. i don't put anything past anybody at this point like the just the way people have reacted to it I'm like, oh yeah, They're like we'll, we'll so there's a portion of society that will behave as if nothing is going wrong. Well, that's true. You you are not wrong. You are not wrong about that. Uh, I I think in fact, Diary of the Dead, the way that people behave is a little too reactive to the situation, and and also you don't have that group that's like, hey, I'm just gonna get bit. I'm living my life, motherfucker. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> don't tell me what to do. <laughs> don't don't tell me I gotta wear some kind of protective clothing to keep zombies from biting me. My body, my choice. <laughs> uh yeah, one thing I did notice about that film, I think it's its biggest fault for me is the voiceover and the actress who delivers it. I I just her delivery is painful to me. And I think that if that had either been done differently or not at all, it would have been a little bit better, but that the whole time I'm just, every time she talks, I'm like, Oh my God, it's bad. And then of course you had the Texas girl, which was just silly. Don't mess with Texas. You know, that one. Yeah. That's right up there with like, go get them. Cause as far as lines that make me want to throw my television through a window, do your thing. Cause what, yeah, whatever the, Oh <laughs> my God, that, that terrible, terrible film. Uh, but yeah, I, I agree with you. I think diary of the dead is it's interesting. Like I, it's an interesting footnote in Romero's career. Cause it's understandable that he would kind of want to try to do this found footage thing, or it's just what they gave him the money to do, whatever the case may have been. But I think the dialogue just cover to cover 
is bad. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, may, the actress may or may not have been helping matters much, but I don't know that any I, Gary Oldman would have a tr- uh, a tough time making that compelling. You know? Oh, you're you know you're you're not wrong. That is that's right. It, the 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 dialogue just of, overall is pretty bad. The reactions to situations are pretty weird. It. Um, and then there's this whole bit where the main guy's talking about how that you know the government is is altering footage that's going online and trying to keep. And I'm like, this thing is everywhere. It's everywhere at this point. Yeah, it, it's beyond the government being able to control the situation or you know lie to people. Like it's it's past that. They can't do, you know. But then they keep like trying to hammer that point home in the film, and I'm like, no, that's stupid. They can't. This is happening in front of your face. They can't lie to you about this. So it's happening to your face. To your face. Um, <laughs> but oh well, that actually kind of rings true today too, doesn't yeah. it? With people, yeah. So I don't know. Maybe he was more spot on than I thought <laughs> with how people would react to things. Yeah. The one thing I've learned through the the pandemic is that whatever your opinion of of people is, they're worse. You know, oh, no, for ma- sure. no matter how bad you think that people are going to behave, they are going to challenge. Uh, that perception by being even shittier than that Um, and it it never still though i i it i still am flabbergasted (laughs) like every time something happens i'm like really yeah it's one of those like i'm I'm, i should know better i'm surprised but not shocked i guess Yes, yes where i'm like yeah i understand that most people uh I, not most people, but a, a healthy percentage of people are just kind of shitty people and, and, and ultimately very selfish. And uh, that, that I've internalized that. But also when you see somebody behave like we had a, a thing here recently that made national news because of a school board situation uh, just north of Nashville. And you know it's just people uh, as you would imagine acting like fucking assholes in a school board meeting and like harassing the doctor who came to speak outside and that kind of thing it's like you know what there's such a thing as a fucking expert you know like i don't know shit about electronics or electricity i know basic fundamentals but if i had to like create a a device that you know uh had current running through it and made it do a thing i don't Mm -hmm. think i could do that because i don't have any training in that regard uh much like i don't have training when it comes to being a doctor and so when a doctor tells me to do some shit i just do it because that's that's their job that's what they went to school for you know i don't when my plumber comes over i don't I, i don't look over his shoulder and be like nope not like that you fucked it up. What are you talking about? Your toilet's working. It's not how I would have done it. You know? I don't know shit about that. Dude, uh, pay, listen to the people whose job it is to do the thing. That's... It, it yeah, that's me why crazy. it's their job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Know? That's exactly why it is their job. And, yeah. and I, I know I'm going to sound like an even bigger dick about this, but I'll tell you another thing, Jamie. Uh, all these like deathbed uh, scales falling from the eyes where people are like, oh, I was wrong. I didn't get the vaccine. I should have fucking a right. You should have. But now you're fucking dead. And you know how much sympathy I have for that? Zero. Because everybody told you this and you just chose not to listen to it. And you had to go out of your way not to get a vaccine. Every Walgreens, Walmart, you know, CVS, CVS I, everywhere, everywhere you go. Somebody's like, hey, you want a vaccine? It's free. It's a miracle drug. Nah, not for me, thanks. I'd much rather take my chances with the disease that could put me on a ventilator. I just have no sympathy for it anymore. And like every time it's like, well, this conservative talk show host who was very anti vaccine ended up getting COVID and now he's on the uh, critical care in the ICU. I'm like, good, good. Maybe that'll be a lesson to somebody else, like some other dipshit that thought that this guy was a real smart fella and now when the guy isn't on the radio anymore because he's about to fucking die maybe that'll put two and two together for him like hey wait a second maybe i should get that vaccine 
I actually, that's, that's kind of what I pull from those situations is the hope that when they do come on and say, look, you know, guys, I was wrong. I, you know, or their family members will come on and say like they were wrong. They, you know, this, look, this happened like, this is not, this is serious. This is not a joke. This is, you know, please listen. I'm hoping that it will at least that, that their death won't be in vain in, in complete vain. And it'll at least show someone else that, you know, you, you, this is something that we can be proactive about. We have to be proactive about. And the ones, the only ones I feel sorry for are the ones who legitimately cannot for sure. some reason. And then I feel sorry for them because then you have the other people who aren't willing to do their part to protect the people who cannot protect themselves. And that, to me is incredibly selfish and it's just, and then I also have this, this like, you know, you who choose not to, but can are basically waiting for the rest of us to do it so that you can be protected. And that is incredibly selfish, you know, yeah. do your part, you know, yeah. You know, remember when you heard that story about your neighbor dying from polio? Yeah. Me neither. It's because they got a fucking vaccine. It's like, it's, it's, I, I don't know. It's like, it's not new. Like, uh, yeah. I, yeah, I know. So it's, many things, so many things. I, but. You know, the, the, I'm, I, there's part of me that's rooting for the Delta variant, you know, that like I'm on the side of the virus at this point where I'm just like, yeah, go get those fuckers. Take, like, let's just get rid of that portion of people like you said not the people who can't take the vaccine because of some health problem but all the dipshits that are like you know my body my choice when it comes to a vaccine not abortion they don't go that far they don't believe that government ought to uh leave women's bodies alone it's just their body about this specific thing yeah, it's a very specific thing, you know, right. or the the whole you can't come to school if you or like go to college if you haven't been. I mean, hell, what do they not remember? I couldn't go to school until I was I couldn't go to elementary school if I wasn't vaccinated. I couldn't go to college if I wasn't vaccinated. When I went to UGA, I had to prove my vaccination record. Mm -hmm. This is not new. Right. It's, it's not new. It's for public health. There's a reason for it. And it's not about microchipping. Like, oh, Jesus if only. Christ. Oh, if, if I personally had 5G, I would be so happy. The amount of pornography I would consume <laughs> at a very high uh, rate of speed, like like good quality, like solid 1080p to 4K porn is what I would be. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, let, let me let me hit you with a movie. Let me. Yeah, do it. Because this is uh, off brand for me, but it's a movie that I kind of want to see if you've ever seen. Okay. So, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I saw the movie The Notebook. Oh, yeah. And I've never... I've I, read the book, too. Have you really? Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. this is perfect. Because this is one of those, like, hey, you know, my girlfriend has to watch uh, uh, some movies that she would never want to watch, uh, independent of of me. And so, when it's her turn to pick a movie, I'm like, what? anything that you want to watch, I'll watch. And so she's got this list of movies uh, that's kind of ever growing of movies I've never seen. And most of them are uh, romantic films to one degree or another. She is, God bless her, has, has uh, the biggest heart and loves romance films. And so she wanted to watch The Notebook on the heels of having watched Dirty Dancing not long before. <laughs> and which I thought was fine. I thought I, Dirty Dancing was one of those movies. As soon as I saw it, I was like, I totally understand why this movie was a big hit. Uh, the Notebook. Uh, I, I here's the thing about the Notebook for me. One, I think that it's really just a vehicle for people to look at Ryan Gosling's nubile body. <laughs> that's probably true. I think there. That's a that's a solid. 80 percent of viewers of the notebook are just like look i'm gonna i'm gonna watch this guy take off his shirt and and be charming as shit and then you know tickle the bean you know what i'm saying jamie yeah i, I do i do know what you're saying yes uh the other thing about the notebook <laughs> that kind of surprised me is spoilers for the notebook everybody a movie that's only <laughs> 17 years old and it was one of the most popular movies and books of, of its time. 
Um, so spoilers for that. But the movie ends with just two old, lovable people fucking dying. And, yeah. and I was like, oh, this is so sad. And she was like, no, no, no. It's happy because they were together. It was like, no, they're both dead. That is the least happy thing that could happen at the end of this movie. <laughs> She's right, though. They died together. And that's the important thing is that they were together. I, I uh, Look, that uh, I made. It's funny that you should bring this up because I actually made Brian watch that movie. Uh, not this no, it might have been this past, uh, not this past Valentine's Day. Or s- it was either Valentine's Day or anniversary or something. I <laughs> made I made him watch it, and he was just like, "Okay," like he promised me he would, so he did. And the whole time, he's just like, "So," I mean, he was just like, "Okay, so they're gonna die, right?" Yeah. And I'm like, "Just, just, just shut up and watch the movie," you know. <laughs> and he didn't, um, he didn't like cry or anything. But uh, when we got to the end, he was just like. Nah. like he wasn't he was just like okay like that's exactly what i thought was gonna happen and i'm like well yeah but like they had such sweet moments you know when he was reading her the story and then you know y- you you realize well i mean it's not hard to realize but you realize that it's their story yeah and then that moment when she suddenly doesn't recognize him anymore i mean that was kind of heart like in the middle of them dancing and then she just doesn't know who he is and that's heartbreaking and or at least I thought it was heartbreaking. But then when it gets to the end, I I am always like I that is exactly how I would want that to end, because I can't imagine him having to go on without her like it. That would have been horrible for him, you know, so I think it actually had the best ending it could have for their story. Unless let me let me pitch you another ending, Jamie. <laughs> Neither of them die. <laughs> <laughs> or, or she, you know, she, because she has dementia and so forth, that he's with her up until the end. And then he just moves on with his life and like watches his grand hit, grandkids grow up a little more. Maybe he meets a new lady friend, somebody to kind of be a companion in the late stages, or maybe not. Maybe he just, you know, like sits down at the dock and looks out over the waters and thinks about this incredible love he had but you know what he's not dead he's not <laughs> dead Jamie. i feel <laughs> i don't know i think that for him he wouldn't have wanted that i think he he wouldn't have wanted to continue without her i i'll tell uh, you the the one thing that got me and i'm you know exaggerating a bit for comedic effect as i do uh, I thought the movie was fine. Like I, I, I didn't dislike it or anything. I probably like Dirty Dancing a little more, in fairness. Um, but because uh, that, that one, I have not made Brian watch yet. But we're coming up to the D's soon, so yeah. he will be, uh, whether I, he wants to or not. I think it's funny <laughs> that you made him watch the Notebook. I, I wonder if that's just a relationship rite of passage of like, all right, <laughs> we're gonna watch the Notebook, and if you don't like fart or just leave, then then you're okay. <laughs> Like you, you've you've overcome this small hurdle, um, but the, I'll tell you the 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 moment I liked most in the Notebook is when and I did the same thing that I think Brian did, where about ten minutes in I was like, oh, so he's reading her their story, yeah, and she was like, shut up, just watch us. <laughs> That was the exact same conversation we yeah. had. I think I think this may be more universal than we think. I think we I think we might have hit upon like a real like epistemological truth here. That well, just... and the thing is, is we're like we know that. Like she, I guarantee you, she knew it just as much as I knew it. But that's not the point. The point is, you have to watch the journey. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> So they're going to die. Shut up and just watch the movie. <laughs> that was, you guys could have been in the same room with us. Yeah. That is, uh, that's hilarious. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the, uh, the other thing that I liked was. Uh, the you have way- to tell her, though, that that was a shared experience. I, was like- <laughs> I will absolutely tell her. Uh, I, she will either find that very funny um, or I'm going to have to watch the notebook again. There's really no telling. <laughs> Uh, so <laughs> you're going to watch it until you learn to appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's terrible. She is, I, I'm painting her in a terrible light. 
uh, w- which is not the case. Um, so anyway, I did like a lot. I like James, James Garner quite a bit anyway. And mm-hmm. I thought the moment when his family, uh, I thought rightfully is like, look, she's kind of bananas. Why don't you just come home with us? Because we all miss you and you can spend time with your children and your grandchildren. And his response was because that's my girl up there. And I was like, well, that's very sweet. I really like that. sentiment. Yeah. I, I responded to that up until the point that he was like, how about we both just die together? And then I was like, Ugh. this isn't the Titanic. You know, we don't have to lay down in the same bed as the, the cold waters of the Atlantic rise. You know, one of like I, from her point of view, she ought to have been like, I want you to go on and be happy well, she with didn't- the life you had left. She didn't even know what was going on most of the time. She wouldn't tell him that. Right. But when she was like, do you think our love can make you dead? I would be like, no, no, I don't think our love can make me dead. I think that's a crazy person talking, which you clearly are. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, all right. So (laughs) your turn. Okay, um, so there's a new movie by the guys who brought us inside. Have you seen Kandisha? No, I have not. Uh, it's on Shutter, and um, I was excited about that because I love Inside, and uh, th- they did the movie. Oh, what was it called? About the people breaking into the house, and then um, oh shoot, it was like a dancer lived there. It's very spotty in my memory. But anyway, a couple of years ago, they did another movie and it wasn't all that impressive. And I was just like, oh, I mean, it was OK, but it wasn't inside, you know. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, they did the Texas Chainsaw mm-hmm. <laughs> prequel that you're like, oh, you got shot in the face. So suddenly you're leather face now. <laughs> like, it's like you were this perfectly normal dude. And then someone shoots you in the jaw and then you turn into like a murdering cannibal. Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Now. I, to be fair, I really enjoy watching that film. I don't think it is a successful, uh, like, origin story. And I didn't fall for the whole, here's the fat guy. He, obviously, he's going to be Leatherface. I didn't fall for that. I knew they were full of shit the whole time. But I still enjoy, there are things about it, like, after the escape. It's a, it's an interesting, like, road movie at, at points. You know, there are things about it I really like. But... Overall, it's not a very successful Texas Chainsaw prequel. So I haven't been all that thrilled with things that they have done since Inside. But with Candisha, I was like, okay, I'm excited about this because it, well, it takes place in France and they are pulling from Middle Eastern mythology, which I love, you know, because we've seen the the same things over and over again you know and i i love it when people pull from mythology that we don't see all that often so i was really excited about this demon in particular uh kind of like with under the shadow um um, another movie i love because it was different you know so i was really excited about this and honestly it's pretty good like i i enjoy it quite a bit i wasn't in love with the overall energy of the film i feel like it could have been more energetic and therefore been more successful in what it was attempting to do but i do really like the story so it's solid and it has some really decent gore uh, actually quite a few bits of decent gore and the look of the demon which changes uh, periodically throughout the film but in just really interesting ways i I like the idea. The only thing is, is that the, the person, I mean, the idea here is it's kind of reminiscent of like a pumpkin head kind of thing where you, someone wrongs you. So you call this demon, but once you do, like she has the, she has um, motivations of her own. And so then it gets out of your control. And so (laughs) the the thing about it that I didn't really think was all that warranted is the person that gets initially is the reason for the calling of the demon is because he, now he attempts to rape her, but nothing happens and he slaps her. And I'm like, is that really worth 
Like, <laughs> like I don't, I don't, I mean, I understand you're mad. Like he's a dick, but I don't think I would call a demon for that. But, and then I was Does like, she well, call the police first. No. Oh, well no. then you're not. She goes straight home and immediately like she's standing in the shower and she's all like angry and, and which I get, like, I totally get her being angry. And then she just immediately calls this demon. I'm like, whoa. And so I told Brian, I'm like, all right, maybe she didn't think it would really work. And she was just doing it out of anger. And, and you know, she wasn't expecting anything to happen. But later in the film, she's like, I really believed it. I really wanted it. I'm like, okay, well, that's a little much. Like, <laughs> like Right. That's, I mean, that's kind of like the, the pie whack it scenario of like, yeah. hey, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to go out into the woods and then, you know, perform this dramatic ritual. And then, oh wait, I did. I didn't think that was going to work. I, I didn't want that to happen. Well, right. then don't do it. Yeah, you know, but it. So, and then what ends up? I mean, I'm not going to spoil it, but um, what ends up happening basically is that so many other people fall victim to this thing that didn't need to and didn't deserve it. And I'm like, nah, see what you did. Like, <laughs> now see what you did. And that, so the motivation is a little bit shaky for me just because I feel like if that, in order for that to have a little more impact, I feel like something more should have happened to warrant it, to, to put, to make me be on her side. Like I wanted to be on her side, but I couldn't really be on her side. You know, it was just because some ex-boyfriend who was abusive attempted to rape her but not successfully and then you know slapped her and i'm like okay that's you know i mean and i'm not saying that that's okay obviously it's not okay but i just feel like if you're gonna if i was gonna call like go through the process of calling a demon down on somebody i would i would think that for me they would it'd be something a little more egregious you know? what what i'm hearing from you jamie is that you're okay with sexual assault yeah well all right you read between the lines very well bo <laughs> no. so uh, okay a couple of things here first of all the movie that i think you were trying to think of earlier is called livid oh yes absolutely um also i like a good hey i fucked up and conjured a demon and i didn't mean to but for me, the bar has kind of been set at a dark song because I really, really like the mm -hmm. detail that that movie has in regard to the construction of the ritual and the toll it takes both physically and mentally. And I think that you ought to have to do that. If you're conjuring an honest to goodness demon from hell, I think it should be a lot of work. And like like month long work kind of thing that you just don't get it done the first night. And yeah, I mean this was basically as easy as calling Candyman. Yeah, you know? and it's just and like and then the the repercussions of it are so. And now the repercussions are fun. Like there are there are some like I said some really good gore. It's there's some some really fun moments as far as that's concerned, but. I just, I had a hard time, I had a hard time, like, rooting for this person, because I'm like, look what the fuck you did. <laughs> and, like, if you, once you see the movie, you'll see exactly how dire the situation is, and, like, what exactly her actions did, and it's pretty, pretty bad. I mean, it just, it's, it's pretty fucking bad, you know, so... Yeah. Uh, but the movie itself is a good movie. I, I really did enjoy it. But like I like I said, I do think it it could have used a little injection of energy. It didn't. It it seemed kind of I don't really know that we're underwhelming at times, mm -hmm. you know. And I'm like I oh, yeah. I mean, but then at other times you've got really great like set pieces and gore scenes, and then and then I feel like other times it was just kind of sleepy. It felt like oh, like like it was too tired to to really do much, but could have been my mindset but i do recommend it it is a very good film all right in all spite right. of all that yeah no i mean I, i'll give it a day in court for sure i've been pretty uh pretty good about kind of rolling through the uh shutter lineup um like i watched that movie bloodthirsty recently uh which is sort of a werewolf movie that you shouldn't see <laughs> 
it's not very good and like that's not the movie i want to talk about but for listeners uh if if you're looking through shutter and you see the movie bloodthirsty and you're like hey that looks interesting it's not take my word for it it's not very good um but i do want to talk about uh, another uh shutter film called home wrecker which okay. got recommended to me by um alan and naomi uh who may may in fact listen to this show i don't know um but you know alan Epst- uh alan phoenix epstein and whatnot uh, oh yeah for sure yeah so he had uh it, it was actually his lovely partner who had kind of recommended the movie and i ended up checking that out and i thought that was terrific uh it's alex esso from uh Dr. Sleep and Starry Eyes. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think her name is Phoenix Chong. Is that her name? Precious Chong. I don't know. Uh, is, is the name of, of the lady. So basically it's Alex Esso is a married woman uh, trying to get pregnant with her husband. Um, she has a yoga class with uh th- this lady uh precious chong uh as played by precious chong it's not her name in the movie um and the like as things go on you start to get the sense that a maybe this woman is not entirely together and might be a little cuckoo but also she has this belief at least that alex esso's husband is her lover and and there's a big question as to whether or not that is tr- is true or not and th- what i really like about it is that it it feels kind of raw at times like by which i mean kind of low budget but clearly everybody in the movie is really going after it and i like alex Alex esso quite a bit myself um and she's very good in it um the the thing i like most is the movie presents itself as being a kind of battle of wills and wits between these two women and then there is a thing that happens at the end of the movie that sort of recontextualizes everything so that you realize, oh, no, 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 this never would have been a thing if it hadn't been for this guy. And huh. and so it really does a nice job of, I, you know, I'm not the smartest person, Jamie, but I think what the movie. I disagree. Well, thank you very much. I think what the movie is ultimately trying to say is that too often times women will get themselves kind of wrapped around the axle about a guy and not understand that they have far more in common, that there is a a sisterhood among women that is spoiled by men much of the time. And it's really interesting. It's really well presented. I like that landing point of the film and uh i really encourage people to check it out it's it's a a very uh a a nice breezy like hour 15 which is also something i can appreciate so it, it feels like an extended short film and it doesn't ever really feel like it's bloated it's just like things continue to happen and uh yeah i really enjoyed it i thought it was quite good um it, it's you know, d- definitely has something to say. And there was much of the movie where I was like, I don't know that I'm really behind the message of this movie as I understood it. And then once it it came to the, the resolution, I, I immediately like left turned and I was like, oh, I'm totally on board for. I love when a movie can do that. I do. I, I love it when I'm like, eh, I'm, eh, eh, and then something happens. You're like, oh, shit. OK. It's not yeah. like to the the extent of something like the Sixth Sense, where you're like, "Oh my God, she was dead the whole time." It's not that, but it yes, but I I agree. I really like it when 
a movie can kind of do that little trick of being like, oh, you thought it was about this, but really it's about this. And and it feels earned. It's not just. Right. You know, yeah, we're just going to pull this out of our ass at the last minute. And then, right. you know, that's a, that's a big thing here is um, we, a movie. Ha- I feel like the movies have to earn what they're doing. And if if I don't feel like you've earned it, then uh, then you're going to piss me off. But if, you know, if I then can go back and knowing what I know at the end and everything fits, then that makes me happy. Yeah, for sure. Um, anyway, but check out Homewrecker. Uh, d- the director is Zach Gain, G-A-Y-N-E. Um, and like I said, it's Alex Esso. It's Precious Strong, Hour 15. Give it a shot. I, see what you think. All wins right there. That's yeah. all in the win column. Uh, all right, hit me with something else. Uh, we're getting, okay. we're kind of close to the end, I think. I know. Well, we did, we've been jawing a lot. Um, do you, do you uh, which is honestly the my favorite part, so it's okay. Did you uh, check out Val yet? I have not. It is kind of on my short list of stuff, but I I just I I haven't gotten to it yet. I hear well, that's, it's good. It is good. That's one that I've been waiting for, uh, and. So as soon as it hit, I like watched it as soon as I could. And what's interesting is that Brian and I have two different viewpoints. He was, he was just like, at the end, he was just like, that was a fluff piece. And I'm like, it kind of was, but so basically what he's doing is, is Val Kilmer has anyone, for anyone who's not familiar, it's the, this autobiography about Val Kilmer and it's taken from this dude has been carrying a camera around basically his entire life. Like pretty much that I think like a good 90% of his life is on video and you get a walk through from his childhood up to his recent, uh, you know, he recently had throat cancer. So he talks with a voice box and his, a lot of the narration, well, all the narration in the film is done by his son and his son sounds exactly like him. It's kind of eerie, but in a cool way. And so you're seeing like from back when he was a, a little kid and then, you know, things that happen with his family. And then as he goes up through college and then he starts working on the stage and then, you know, he, he takes you through his various movies and, and stuff like that. And you learn a lot of interesting things. I honestly was very touched by it because Val Kilmer has this uh, reputation of being difficult to work with and being a bit of an asshole. But when I was watching this, what I felt was a very sensitive person and Brian wanted more of a, an exploration of where his reputation comes from. Basically, I guess he wanted to hear Val's side of the story, like, you know, about like, and you do get a little bit of that. They don't really go into it that much, not as much as you, as you might want. But what I found from it was this, this was a man who was, uh, who is an artist and he loves the stage. He loves the art of acting and making movies. And it was a really touching look at the artist side of things and how, and how like his dedication to the art, I think in, in certain instances did get in his way and and did maybe make him come off as difficult to work with when, what I got from it was really that in those times, it was likely him being the perfectionist that he is and wanting to do the best possible performance that he could and wanting to pull from whatever role it was, everything that he possibly could, but that doesn't always line up with what a director wants you to do. So, you know, then you end up butting heads and, and no, I think it could have explored those things a little more and it would have been interesting. But what I did get from it was a very touching story. And I cried a couple, you know, several times, which I know is not surprising, but I, it, what it made me do is it, it made me want to get back into the arts because I haven't really done anything since I moved to Michigan. But while I'm watching this film, I started Googling uh, like local playhouses and stuff because it kind of reawakened the desire in me to want to get back into 
performing and get back into being involved in the community as far as that goes. And, you know, so I thought that was, it means something, you know, it, at least it did to me, you know, it, it touched me. So I, I think that people who lean more toward the artistic or, or the creative side will probably get a lot out of it. And it was, uh, it was a very sad journey in a lot of ways. It was a happy journey in a lot of ways. I just thought it was really, really good. I, I enjoyed it. And no, he didn't go into a lot of sensationalism and he didn't uh, like highlight a lot of the arguments that he's had over the years or, or the, the butting of heads necessarily. But I, I feel that we kind of got to see things from his point of view and it, and it's really kind of sad because he's reached this point in his life where that part of his life could be over because he is now, you know, talking through a voice box. Now he did say that he's in the healing process. So I'm not sure that they didn't actually say for sure, but I mean, I guess there is maybe a chance that, that he would, you know, heal past this and, and be able to do something more, but you kind of get the impression that it's like at the end for him, which is very tragic and very sad because he did this, uh, he, he did a, uh, he spent a lot of time on this one man show that he wrote and performed of Mark Twain, which I would honestly love to see. Because I never realized, like, watching him in, you know, Top Gun or Batman or whatever, I never realized how much of an artist he was. Like, I didn't, I never delved that much into him. And I didn't really, you know, peek that far behind the curtain. But he is an artist first and foremost. And he was born to be on the stage. I think that's where he, he never seemed to be happy in film. He seemed to be happiest on the stage. And that is a look at, of, you know, that's a look at him that I never, I never took before. And I really appreciated that. He also showed some, so he did two uh, video proposals. I got for um, one of them was for Goodfellas. He wanted to play, uh, he wanted to, to play the main role in Goodfellas and he, or Henry. And he, you actually got to see part of the the video that he made and submitted. And I'm like, that would have been really good. I honestly, and now I love Ray Liotta in that role and I, I would, wouldn't take it away from him. But honestly, I think if Val had gotten that role, it would have been very good. So it's, I don't know. It's just a completely different look. And maybe other people were aware of this uh, about him. Mm -hmm. I just, I just never was. I never, I never paid that much attention to him. He was just, you know, a guy on the screen, but this actually gave you a little bit of a deeper look and I thought it was really nice. Huh? Well, that, that's very nice. I'll, I'll definitely, uh, take a look at it. I'm like, I, I think I'm with Brian in the sense that I was kind of hoping it would be a little bit of a discussion of, of sort of the, his his career and why he felt like, you know, he eventually kind of fell out of the mainstream in terms of movies and stuff. And maybe there's some of that, but, um, I, I'm very, very curious, uh, to, to see, I like Val Kilmer a lot, like real genius and top secret are still among my favorite comedies. And, uh, I it, it's because of Val Kilmer. I think he is just an absolutely amazing comedian. <laughs> Oh. oh, he is. And he and w another thing you get from this, too, is just how much of a comedian he is in regular everyday life, which I think if you watch things like Real Genius, I think it's pretty clear that that is his personality. You know, I don't think you can pull off some a role like that if that's at least part of that isn't you. And you get the, you get how comedic he is. And, you know, he's fucks around with his kids a lot. And it's it's. I don't know. It's, it was just, it was nice. And I agree. Now don't get me wrong. I, I really did want to, to know more of that. Like I wanted to, I wanted to go deeper into that. That's just not where he chose to go with this, but there, yeah, I definitely want to, and I, especially now after seeing this, like, I really want to know what, you know, are they right? Like, was he that bad or was he, was it just uh, um, more a place where the minds didn't meet? You know, was it just he had different goals and they had 
goals that didn't align with his, you know, but he has some really wonderful things to say about working on things like tombstone. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just, I don't know. I, and, and he's so appreciative or he, he just feels so appreciative of like, he goes to screenings and stuff now. And at first he talks about how he was afraid to do that because he doesn't look the way he used to look. He doesn't sound the way he used to sound. And he didn't want people to, he, he didn't want to expose himself like that, you know, to fans. But what he found is that the fans are the fans and they love him for those things that he did. And he actually appreciates that now and then gets some joy from it. So I don't know. It was, it's like a, it's like an, for me, it was like a really emotional roller coaster and I loved it. But. Yeah. Normally you're so unemotional. So it's but, really interesting. To, oh, to see something that finally taps into that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so something that can draw that out of you. I you have know? such a poker face most of the time. No one ever knows what I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like you're the, one of the reasons you're a great card player. <laughs> well, that's the, why i have no money <laughs> yeah um all right we're, we're about to wrap it up i i do want to have one honorable mention from myself here uh that is just a, a real problem i've had this weekend where i tumbled down a, a pretty dark rabbit hole with the show alone Ooh, uh, not familiar all right so it's on the history channel and here's here's the premise is you take 10 people uh the the first two seasons at least are on uh vancouver island in british columbia and so you they're allowed to take 10 things with them and then you drop them out in the middle of nowhere and be like all right best of luck here's a satellite phone call us when you want to come home and so it's, you know, kind of a reality show competition kind of thing. But the thing that I really dig about it is there's that inevitably, like I've only watched about a season and a half of it, but at the beginning of uh, every season or the two that I've seen so far, there's the, at least one one dude that's like, oh, I didn't think it was going to be like this. Uh, I'm ready to go. Can I go now? Uh, like, I know I've only been here about eight hours. Damn. But, yeah, but the, the like people will tap out real fast, and it always happens as soon as they see a bear, because uh, there are uh, bears uh, all uh. over the place there, and they see a bear and they're like, "Oh, I yeah, I knew there were bears, but I didn't know there would be bears like that where they're just all around you." And uh, so yeah, I'm not gonna get eaten by a bear, so I'm gonna go home now. And then there are the dudes that are like, you can tell that this is just their thing and you're like oh you're gonna win because you uh either are kind of a cast out of society to begin with or you're just like an old grizzled navy dude that's just never gonna give up but it's it's really fun i really like it it doesn't have the usual like backbiting because the the contestants never interact with one another it's really just watching individuals out in the middle of nowhere for sometimes a couple of months and and that's the stuff that i find really interesting and and the thing i like about it uh and i'm gonna end on an emotional note here is that to a person anyone who stays longer than these six hours of like oh i saw a bear and now how quick can you pick me up um anybody that stays for any length of time on this island in their you know little uh their areas um immediately they're like the hardest part of this isn't so much finding food and finding water it's being alone with yourself for that long that the, you know the 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 lesson that the show ultimately teaches i think is that what is important in life is the people that you care about and the people that like that that need for social interaction and for you to be able to like say to someone good morning or just have a any kind of exchange and to both feel and and give love and that is the thing that breaks people more than the environment does is just the, the like the unending 
kind of boredom and the fact that the only person you're interacting with is yourself and the kind of shit that dredges up like inevitably there are two or three people every every season or at least the two that i've seen so far that are just like yeah i really need to talk about some shit that happened when i was a kid um oh wow yeah you know, like it, it gets it gets kind of raw sometimes, and I uh, uh, I really like it. But they're all weirdos. That's the other thing I like is that any <laughs> in, anybody that tells you like, hey, I'm gonna go out for six weeks to uh, two months on this reality show where it's gonna be me a saw and you know a sleeping bag, and I'm just gonna live out in the middle of nowhere for a couple of months. I think you got to have a little bit of a screw loose to begin with. Well, that's true. So, but the point being, Jamie, is that uh, the the lesson that everyone learns on that show is how important other people are uh, to, to your own happiness. And I say that uh, both in closing the show and to say to you, I'm so glad we get to do this. Uh, it, is, it is a wonderful time and I adore you. I'm so glad that uh, you are a person that I could I get to spend time and do this with. Aww, that's so unlike you. <laughs> oh, it's really not. But <laughs> but you know, like when we do shows with Duncan or whatever, we're always just like, rawr, rawr, rawr. yeah. Um, it's you know, it honestly, I think people can tell. Um, I've had people since we've started doing this, even say things like, you know, it's so good to hear you and Bo together again, because you, you know, you guys have this chemistry when we talk about whatever it's, whether it's movies or we, you know, talk about dead puppies or whatever. There's a, there's, there is something there and it's because I do care about you so